Now, while we're getting some language problems sorted out here at the start of the module, let's look at a familiar one, which is the difference between what we might call the mental and what we might call the physical. And we'll frequently find a related opposition as we talk about the mind and the brain. You might think that's a fairly simple distinction. You might think a tomato or a table is a physical object and a thought or a feeling is a mental object, but it's not that simple. Distinguishing between how we use these words is something we're going to have to be quite delicate with. Not all languages draw a distinction here, and that's always a good clue um, that perhaps the categories that you're familiar with and happy to use might be influenced by the culture in which you happen to live. For example, there's no single word for mind in German. We don't have to go very, very far. Given that we are in the scientific domain and we are hoping to characterize the real, we'll have to bear in mind that some of the ways in which we are thinking are undoubtedly local to our culture and are not actually part of reality. But we can only think with the concepts that we have, so we'll do our best. Let me give you an example of how the mental physical is not a simple distinction. Usually when people assume it is, they assume that the physical is fairly simple. That's stuff you can kick. And the mental, well, that's going to be difficult. Don't know where it is. Might be in brains, spirits, ghosts. I don't know where that is. But have a look at this. This is a Caravaggio painting, and it shows the famous moment when Doubting Thomas, an old skeptic, wanted proof of the risen Christ. And the proof he wanted was it wasn't enough for him to see Christ with his own eyes. He wanted to put his finger in the wound, and I can make this really gory if you like, and poke and feel it wet. Now, in some sense, what he was looking for was physical proof, the kind of proof that is indubitable. And yet, seeing, feeling, poking, these are not easily describable in physical terms. They belong far more to the mental. So he was looking to assuage his doubt. And sometimes we use the word physical to mean that. We mean it to mean something that we undoubtedly experience, for example. And experience has no place in physics unfortunately. Um, so even when we're using the word physical, very, very often we're relying um, on the pe people we're talking with to understand the sense of indubitable or real that we mean. Let's have a look at how physical is used on Twitter, for example. It's physically impossible for me to pay attention during class. Now that sense of the word physics is not likely to be found in a physics textbook. Physically attractive high school students. I don't know what notion of physics might countenance a notion of even attractiveness or even a high school student. Hmm. Have you ever missed someone so much you feel physically sick? Feeling and physical in the same sentence. And we often talk about being physically sick. It made me physically sick to the pit of my stomach. I physically cannot sleep with pants on, says Bambi. Again, we'll look in vain in the physics textbooks. I'm physically hurting. Oh my God, look up Bruno. 10 out of 10 agree that it is physically impossible to say no to this face. Now, as funny as these are, they're worth thinking about because people use this word a lot, physical, and they use it to mean very real. But they don't always mean what the stuff that's found in the science of physics. Now, the science of physics itself has a history. Um, we usually date modern, well, we date the scientific modernity as having begun about 400 years ago. And one of the major figures there was Sir Isaac Newton, who you may have heard of sitting under trees and having apples fall on his head. And Newton was part of uh, many figures who collectively brought into being a scientific a view of the universe that was divorced for the first time from theology and from the gods. Uh, and his physics was mechanical physics. He introduced some brand new notions, including the notion of force. 
Um, his big book, The Principles of Natural Philosophy, came out in 1687. Newton did a lot more besides physics, incidentally, as well as writing the book on physics and optics. He was also a very interesting character whose greater interest lay in alchemy and in biblical prophecy. So he was a man of many sides. Now, the physics that he blessed us with reigned from about 1700 up to the start of the 20th century when it was overthrown <laughs> and it was replaced with modern physics. Um, the mechanical physics of Newton corresponds fairly well in some respects to our sense of physics as describing things we can kick. Billiard balls interacting on a table, for example, are well described using Newton's concepts. But unfortunately, the scientific vocabulary of Newtonian physics is of no use for discussing minds or even living the life. The science of biology is not subsumed within this. Newton's vision was grandiose. He gave a link between the motions of bodies in the heavens and motions of bodies here close to hand, remember the apple falling on his head, and showed that they were guided by the same principles. This unification of what was the heavens and the earth was huge. And it gave us, for the first time, a scientific cosmology, but one with no place in it for the mind, no place in it for the activities of any agent, anyone who could be said to do something. Many people find mechanical explanation in the broadest sense satisfying. We like to think that there's no spooks involved. But the kind of mechanical explanation that arises out of Newtonian physics explains only limited amounts of things, such as the interaction of solid bodies moving under idealized conditions. Too often people seem to assume that science simply provides mechanical explanations and so many scientific papers start off lamentably in the following fashion. Humans do X, Y, or Z. We've no idea why. The mechanism by which they do this is unknown. Now, to introduce your argument and assume that there's a mechanism for something which is vaguely defined is unfortunately a very, very common sin. But anyway, Newton's physics is not our physics. Our physics was overthrown and we got both the Einsteinian general and special relativity, and we got the whole wonderful quantum field, quantum mechanics. Um, there's still a lot of work going on. There's still a lot of controversy. There's still a lot of um, exploration in the domain of physics. But modern physics is even further removed from experience than Newtonian physics. In modern physics, you'll never find a billiard ball. The kind of observations that are made are either at enormous time scales or tiny time scales, at enormous spatial scales or tiny spatial scales. Modern physics is fascinating, and there is something of a dialogue between cognitive science and modern physics, but that is largely work to come. It's a very fascinating area. But basically, when we say physical if we're referring to physics, we mean one thing, but if we're using it in an everyday sense, matters are much more mixed up. Given that different scientific disciplines are constructed differently and rely on different distinctions, we may have to agree to differ sometimes. And remember, science is not a single oracle of truth. Science is a set of methods, means for developing reliable stories that we can agree on, that garner consensus. But scientists will not be much use in separating a class of phenomena called the physical from the mental. Um, one thing scientists have to be careful of is to listen for how other scientists and other disciplines talk about their objects. And cognitive science is particularly demanding in this respect because many of the concepts that we're dealing with change as you move from, for example, physics into chemistry or from chemistry into biology or, God help us, into behavioral science. Now, cognitive science as a term arose in the 1970s and the logo for the Cognitive Science Society had all these words written around it, which they thought at the time in the 1970s represented the disciplines that were most relevant to the concerns of understanding what human cognition or human knowing is. Let's have a look at them. There's linguistics, neuroscience, philosophy, psychology, anthropology, 
artificial intelligence, education. Now that list could have been constructed differently and in class we will look over some different ways in which that list could have been constructed. But you can see that cognitive science was thought of from the outset as something that draws on very many disciplines and that is necessarily going to give us challenges in making the insights that arise within one field usable within another field. Sometimes we have to be translators and learn how to get linguists to talk to neuroscientists so that the linguists don't make awful mistakes about brains and the neuroscientists don't make awful mistakes about language and so on. So cognitive science was interdisciplinary from its start and that's going to be our main topic in class as well. We're going to be talking about what the challenges and opportunities and strengths of that are.